Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, Season 4.5, our second half of <laughs> Season 4, Episode 15. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Charlebois. Our special guest on this episode to kick the year off in the right direction in all kinds of different ways is founder and CEO of Aaron Wellness Support Supplements, Aaron Ashley. 20 years in the Canadian health food industry. Uh, 2021, she was on Dragon's Den and got a deal with uh, with Arlene. What a life story. What an intersection of her life and My her goodness. passion around fitness and her products. What a great interview. And that's coming up in a little bit. Yeah, I enjoyed it. What about you? Uh, blown away. Blown away. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, you know, it's uh, she, she's... Uh, She's very modest in a way, but very energetic. And uh, oh, she's uh, she's honest with herself. Her story is so compelling. And uh, no, mm -hmm. I mean she's won awards now. She, I mean, going to Dragon's Den uh, is not an easy thing, especially when you're alone as an entrepreneur, yep. uh, a woman. Uh, no, she's uh, she's a leader, and uh, and uh, she she mentioned her daughter a few times and. I think her most, the most important thing uh, for her, I think, is to inspire her own daughter. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but no, yeah, absolutely. I think it's. I mean, she really uh, she 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 walks the talk. <laughs> I can say that. Like she's in the biz. She's in the business. She should be for sure. Yeah, we talk we talk about some technical stuff like around changes for the natural health products uh, and that industry. You've written some op eds about that, so we'll talk about yep. that a little bit. We talk about that in the interview, but also just you know, hey, we couldn't we couldn't pass the opportunity to have her at this time in January and give us some health and fitness uh, tips for all the listeners. So it's a great interview coming up. Now uh, you sound a bit different. I think I'm finding you where I'm finding you in Banff today at a pork conference. Right? Is that That's where you right. are today? Yeah, it's, right. it's, there's it's an international uh, pork uh, seminar. Uh, there's about a thousand people here uh, from all over the world, and uh, so uh, it's actually been going on for a couple of days. Tomorrow's the last day. I'm keynote mm. for uh, for the last day, and um, I mean, eighty percent of the crowd uh, are Canadians, uh, but you, okay. you have Americans, uh, Europeans, and so I'll be talking more about. Uh, came policy, but uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be energy. I mean, I I went, I walked into the room. It's always nice to walk into the room empty and see all these big screens. Yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, it's always nice. I I really really get a kick out of going on stage and and do my thing. You know, fantastic. Now there should yep. be some friends of the pod in the audience, right? Vince, uh, yep. Breton, I'm sure, and, and I will be uh, talking about the pod, of course, uh, okay. and you. So you, you, so everyone will see your big <laughs> face on the screen. There's, there's actually three screens. So wow. uh, yeah, at well, eight o'clock in the morning. So that's gonna wake people up. <laughs> rise and su rise and rise and shine. All right. Yeah. Well, um, maybe we'll talk a little bit later uh, next uh, next week, next episode about uh, what you had to say. But uh, let's leave it. Uh, let's leave that one for there. Uh, myself, I'm on the way. Busy January. I'm on the way to New York. Uh, yeah, you're going tomorrow. to New York. Yeah. Big, yeah, there's a big retail conference there. And for the first time ever, uh, they've got a food service innovation display center. And there's about 35,000 people that go. And it's really the first time that they're getting and wrapping in food service in a meaningful way. So uh, I'm going to visit that. All right, let's get into the news. So I want to start with just a quick follow-up of a story we've been tracking Um I guess two stories. One uh, is this whole, you know, we've been tracking this uh, children working in food processing plants in the U.S., and we've been tracking that story. So I just wanted to give the listeners an update. There's an article over the holidays in New York Times about uh, how, you know, you and I talked about how on earth could the brands not see this? It was like happening right under their nose. Yeah. And we were like, how do these big brands not see it? You know, it's contracted. It Well, according to this uh, article in New York Times, it's, it's basically they don't want to it's, it, they don't want to see it. They basically, they hire people. Don't ask, don't ask, don't tell. They hire inspectors to go in and the inspectors work like maybe nine to five. And if they file too many reports, they kind of don't, it's a don't rock the boat thing. Can't report something you don't see. Anyway, it's a pretty damning article. It doesn't, it doesn't cut it anymore. Well, it, it doesn't it, cut it anymore. It, it, you know, it's going on in 2023. I mean, it's not like it's yeah. from a hundred years ago. So anyway, it was just always a mystery to me. How would you not see like a 13 year old uh, cleaning uh, equipment 
you know, how would you not see that and catch that? But anyway, well, it's sorry, like the Joe Fresh crisis like in 2013. Uh, so it's more than a decade ago. Hmm. It uh, that was the wake up call for Loblaw. All of a sudden, that Bangladesh uh, building collapsed. A thousand workers uh, well, working expected. for Joe Fresh, uh, supporting a brand. Uh, they really didn't uh, care uh, really all that much about what was going on. In the, in Bangladesh until the building collapsed and, and, and Canadian media was actually all over that. And, uh, and they actually decided to implement a, a, a strategy and there was a course of action addressing the issue. And, and so I think a lot of companies do learn from crises, but, uh, in the case of the New York times, uh, it's not really a crisis. It's really media doing its work. Mm. <laughs> hoping that perhaps it would lead to some change, but there's no crisis yet. Joe Fresh went through a crisis. He had to rebuild yeah. the building and people died. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was quite tragic. And I guess the other thing, you made a funny comment on, uh, on X about, uh, you know, what, what are we up to? I think we're now, uh, and hopefully I don't think there'll be any more, seven people passed away or died from, from bad poison cantaloupes. <laughs> and you said... You know, how many people have died from, uh, you know, from Boeing Airlines? The door falls out and they shut every airline down. Like it's just an order of magnitude of urgency around things. You know what inspired that post? What? You, my friend. Ah, okay, okay. Because, you know, it, when and, and you're right, before the holidays, you were talking about, you know, failures related to the automotive sector, some issues with recalls and uh there, there's 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 little seriousness given to food recalls even even when people die and uh, and I think you're right you're absolutely right I think we should we, and and of course uh, for, from a from a risk management perspective I think there's there is some good work being done in Canada but from a risk mitigation perspective my goodness we're we're just not there and uh, we're exposing people and I do believe that uh, we didn't need to see seven people die as a result. Of, and and by the way, there are more people who died in Canada versus the U.S. Yeah, and very sick, right? I mean, you can be very sick. So anyway, I thought those two things. We I don't want to beat those two things uh, to death, so to speak. Um, yeah. Excuse the pun, but uh, anyway, I wanted to touch on those two things. Now, let's talk about it. it's the first episode of the new year. So I, I guess it's pretty risky to eat cantaloupes on Alaska uh, Alaska Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> Put all those things together. Uh, and don't eat don't eat cantaloupe on Alaska Airlines. Um, there, there you go. If you take nothing else away from the podcast today, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Watch what's in that food tray they serve you. Um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk about predictions. So uh, we wrapped up our last episode in 2023 with kind of a what were the big stories for 2023. What do you? You know, I, I guess the Canada Food Price Report in and of itself is the biggest body of prediction that you do collectively and that you lead. But do you have any other predictions in mind about what you imagine you would see other than kind of connected to price? Like what are the big trends that you're keeping your eye on? And what do you, you know, if you had to make a few predictions about what you think you'll see in 2024, what would they be? Well, I think the big one is the code of conduct. I think it is going to happen in 2024. We just don't know how it's going to look like, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it's going to be mandatory or not. Um, so that I'm certainly curious, but I think it will happen in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, competition, uh, I do see 2024 as the year when uh, – loyalty is going to be the main bat battleground. I, I actually think that grocers uh, are, are going to have a much harder time to protect margins. Um, they, uh, they see the marketplace uh, bargain hunting like intensively. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they want our business. And, uh, and so obviously they're going to have to fight. I, I do think that loyalty is going to be a big, big, big issue. Uh, probably not, uh, at the beginning, but probably midway through the year. Yeah. Well, you know what the uh, the thing I'm paying the closest attention to is this uh, what they call the mortgage cliff, and I guess the the chicken little scenario is that something like uh, between 2024 and 2026, if everyone renews their mortgage that is scheduled to at the current rates, it would take something like 20 percent of all discretionary income out of homes out the of the system. Spending. Yeah. 
and that's just discretionary. So you can imagine. I mean, basically, we I, I do foresee the rates coming down. I'm, so it's better to renew your mortgage in a number that starts with a four, not a six. Um, but I do think you're absolutely right that there'll be pressures from a lot of ends for a lot of Canadians who are renewing their mortgage and saying, listen, you know, I got to find another extra two, three, five, seven hundred dollars this month. Um, and yeah. some will come out of discretionary, but some's going to have to come out of sharper pricing and, and sharper shopping for, for food. The, the other thing, of course, 2024 is an election year in the U.S. Uh, that's always mm. a, an interesting path. Gonna be noisy. Going to be noisy. To November. Yeah. So it's going to be noisy. Biden's policies are going to be impacted by, by, by the by the election, I'm sure. Uh, I, haven't Lincoln, seen many, I haven't seen many food issues come up either either in the Republican primaries or the Democrats. It's mostly been, I mean, right now it's dominated by international stuff, but it's mostly been around technology and energy and climate. Um, you don't really well, hear it's, a lot It's the of, America first uh, policy that mm, really mm. can impact trades. Uh, and, of course, uh, I mean, the big issue is, is, is the Canadian dollar, of course. Uh, the Canadian dollar can be impacted one way or another. And uh, and th- that's why I think I, I know a lot of people want a, a lower uh, rate benchmark rate, but that tends to not support the dollar all that well, <laughs> and that yeah. could actually yeah. impact many sections of the grocery store. So I'm always a little bit concerned about uh, about some of the volatility created by uh, the geopolitics that we see uh, down yep. south. I mean, America matters. What can I say? It matters more than Ottawa. And so uh, Washington has more of an influence on our food basket than Ottawa does. In fact, Ottawa is just not helping at all. We know that it's not helping. The, the rhetoric coming out of Ottawa is not mm-hmm. helping. And, uh, but, uh, but I do believe that what goes on in, in, in the United States it will impact Canada for sure. Mm-hmm. So what do you expect in 2024? Yeah, listen, I think the biggest thing is, is food affordability uh, in terms of what people have to spend, and this is based on this mortgage cliff and and the amount of money, I think that's a, that's at risk. I mean, the economy I see is, you know, in the U.S. is going to be probably the, you know, like the snuffleupagus. Uh, we interviewed Ira Kalish, chief global economist from uh, Deloitte. He said, "Look, you're probably going to have a soft landing. The economy is going to be pretty good in America, so that's good for Canadians." Uh, Generally, I think that's going to be good for everybody. I think the easy days, are, and this is relevant to us, the the easy go go days of easy money are are gone, uh, which means you know if you've got a new idea, whether that's plant based, whether that's uh, you know lab grown meat, it's going to be very hard to find the money. Um, so I think there'll be less money around, so there may be a little less innovation. Uh, and then I got, I got to wonder what's going to happen with the climate. I mean, we just got the numbers. Uh, last year is the hottest year on Earth. Is that going to continue? And, of course, that will have a dramatic effect on, um, you know, climate will have a dramatic effect on the price of food. And I'm sure you guys have factored it in in some way, shape, or form or many yep. ways into the, into the food price report. But, you know, <laughs> you know when we see, um, you know, play, where you are today in Calgary, they're finally getting winter, right? But I guess they had like the warmest or less snow in 100 years or in forever. The uh, biggest problem is is water, really. There yeah, wasn't yeah. much snow uh, on the ground. And mm. uh, people are already talking about wildfires in January mm. because of the of the lack of snow. No so snow you want – you because yeah, yeah. it's not it's – not, like it's not snowing all that much. Uh, mm. It's uh, it's cold, but it's not snowing, which is which is a concern. You know, even talking to Aaron, our guest, you know, talking about this more health focus. Uh, you know, a lot more people are paying a lot more attention to those things. And I think so. You know, yeah, absolutely. I and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if health is a, a, a overarching theme uh, at Seattle this year in Montreal for sure. I I, I perceive that this will be a year of more scrutiny around ultra processed food as well i'm expecting ottawa to write a 10 billion dollar check to get aldi into canada how's that <laughs> I'm, I'm going bold i'm going you're, bold you're going bold that's a, yeah that's how i want million my... dollars for yeah, 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 for yeah, more yeah. competition oh galen yeah, western yeah. will like that that's how i want my oh. tax dollars spent yeah, there you go <laughs> there you go uh, I mean, I, I I got a call from a reporter. We need more competition. Who do you think is going to come into Canada? Nobody. 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 No. Nobody. And, and but who am I watching? Dollarama. Sure. Alimentation Costal. I mean, those are game players. They want they want to 
play a much larger role. They're here. They understand the game market. I do. Dollarama is selling more food now, and they're likely going to sell even more food this year. I think yeah. C stores are under a revolution. I mean, revolution. TNT, Loblaw owned TNT is going to the U.S. Yeah. While no, and while we're begging, begging to get people in here, our ministers yeah. calling everyone. <laughs> Yeah, to get a bit of a into niche. Canada. I mean, they're a bit of a niche, though, uh, to say the least, right? I mean, they're a specialty, even though they're Loblaws. But don't you think it's a bit ironic? You know? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I think the whole thing's very Wouldn't you see Canada as a niche market? It's, We're I, only 40 million people. Listen, the, fa- the fact that the minister is asking you to come here should be, wait a minute, why are you, am I going to have to talk to you again? I, you know, when you when the folks from outside of Canada watch what's happening here, they're like, why would we want to operate there? Yeah, like, exactly. It seems like a pretty complex environment. And I, I go to New York and tell Americans we don't need a cold chain. We don't need an expensive <laughs> cold chain. We live in igloos here. Yeah. There you go. That'll set them up well for success. That will right save there. you a lot of money. Yeah, before we get to our interview, I want to talk about your, your op-ed, which I found fascinating, actually, uh, between proteins – uh, so plant-based protein prices. Oh, you saw and, that, yeah. And I thought it was fascinating because it, it was really interesting how, you know, you kind of tracked over time, uh, not just four next years, year, not four years, year, four yeah. years, uh, the, which what you call or what we call the trifecta, chicken, pork, and, and beef, and the percentage increases. But compared to the percentage increases around plant-based substitutes, oh my God, they've gone up significantly and they're much more dynamic in the pricing. So as you, I, I love the way you finished that, your op-ed piece, you basically said, "Listen, you know, if you're if you're if you're looking on plant-based, you're not doing it because you want to save money. You're doing it because you want to make a different lifestyle choice." But I found that fascinating, right? That the cost yep. inputs are just higher and more significant for plant-based. Yeah, we is- were playing around with numbers mm-hmm. uh, the last four years because a lot of people, you know, they they call us and say, "My goodness, meat is so expensive now." Is it really? And so we looked at uh, pricing behaviors. Since uh, 2020, only to figure out that, I mean, the meat trifecta itself is probably up 7%, but it is it is so volatile. Mm-hmm. So the psychology at the meat counter is, is quite impactful. People are shocked. They're sticker shocked when they see that chicken filet or they see that uh that uh, sterling, chickens or whatever. Steak, yeah. Exactly. And, or that that picture on 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 twitter uh they they're they're just marked for life they're marked psychologically but nobody took pictures of lentils and chickpeas and dried beans and tofu but when you look at those products they've gone up about on average 23 to 25 wow. percent wow. in the last four years so seven percent versus 25 percent the difference really the reason why most people think that meat products have gone up more it's just because it's more volatile, and, and people will remember higher prices. So the argument that I'm making is that, well, don't go plant-based to save money. Uh, you can actually save money buying meat, but you got, you got to be a little bit more careful. No, that's a, that's a big theme that, you've, that I hear coming from you. Be more careful. Be the savvy shopper, and, and you can get through. Uh, you, yeah. can, uh, you can find and feed the family and uh, – you know, we're probably still going to deal with food insecurity, and we'll talk to, talk about that for the rest of the season, of course, as it as it comes up. For now, uh, let's take a break uh, from the news. Let's get to our fantastic interview with yes. Aaron Ashley. Aaron, welcome to the Food Professor Podcast. Thanks for helping us kick off 2024. How are you? I'm fantastic. This is the best way to start 2024 with you guys. Yeah, Happy New Year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy Thank New Year. Well, we we completely agree. Where are we finding you today? I am in. Well, it's still dark. <laughs> Vancouver, British Columbia. <laughs> we're supposed to get snow. So I think one of the first times we're getting snow uh, this year. So we're quite, we're all excited. Yeah. Good. Well, and, and are you typically, this is early, you know, we're recording this at 10 a.m. my time, 11 at Sylvanus, but are you typically an early riser? You did accept the invitation. Hopefully we didn't get you out of bed. Oh, gosh, no. I'm up, I was up at 4.30 this morning. So I am a very, Come on. yeah, I do the gym first thing. Get the workout oh. done first thing in the day. Otherwise, it's harder to get done later in the day. So. Yeah, yeah, I've already been up. Well, the dog, everything. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Same here. Same here. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, listen. Uh, thanks again for for joining us. You've had quite a journey looking at your life from uh, at least on paper in the fitness and wellness industry, and and now you're an entrepreneur. And and could you start by telling us a bit about your experience and 
you know, track that for us and, and, and what brought you to become CEO of a wellness nutraceuticals business? I would love to. Um, well, I was raised in a, like a household where my dad was a, I guess, hobbyist bodybuilder and my mom was a figure skating coach. So athletics and aesthetics were always super important in our household. Mm-hmm. And I was always an overweight kid and my parents in their desperate attempt to help me put me in Weight Watchers at 13. Mm. And so as I sat wow. in that room, I know, and I have a 15 year old now, and I know my mom and I have worked through all this and I have a book I've written on it that we co-wrote together. But, you know, she looks back now and is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. But mm. they put me in Weight Watchers in hopes to help me. And I remember sitting in that room, looking at all these 30 year old women thinking I am too much and I am not enough all at the same time. Mm. And so then shortly after that, a classmate told me about his sister who struggled with bulimia. And in my little 14 year old brain, I thought, this is the winning ticket. I can eat whatever I want and then I'll be skinny and I'll win and people Mm. will like me. And so that really started my 25 year battle with bulimia. And as I got into my twenties, um, I started doing fitness competitions. And so I competed for 13 years, but I competed probably three, four times a year because what I found is that was the only time I didn't have issues with my eating disorder. And it was about 13 years ago. I started a career also in nutraceuticals. I was an account manager. I've worked all across Canada for some of the biggest supplement companies. And I also was a holistic nutritionist, really good at giving advice and a trainer, but not so good at taking it myself. And it was about 13 years ago, I had my aha moment. And I, yet again, it's kind of like with everything, when you have an addiction or you're dealing with something, it's always like, hey, Monday, I'm going to start. I'm not going to do this anymore. And yet again, I found myself in the bathroom and I was going to purge and there was a knock at the door. And this time it was my little three-year-old daughter and she had never been locked out of the bathroom. When you have little kids, I think you know that you've given up your privacy keys. And mm-hmm. um, I remember when I rose up from, cause I was on my knees and I caught my reflection in the mirror and I was like, if I don't get a grip on this, this is going to be her. She is going to have issues with food in her body. And that was what really started my healing journey and stepping back and using cognitive behavioral therapy and nutrition and movement and really started working for the next two years on healing myself. Shortly after that, about five, six years ago, I was actually packaged out from the supplement company I was working with. They sold to one of the biggest companies in Canada And I always wanted to do my own brand. I knew that when I was, when I worked through all my issues, I still was really needing great and uh, really good supplement support. And there was nothing on the market that spoke to me, nothing that had the clinical doses that was made for women by women. And so when I was packaged out, I rolled the dice. I took the money that I received Mm -hmm. and I started Erin Wellness. And that really is, we're now 13 products in and we're sold... I think almost five, 600 stores across Canada, on Amazon, online, and then also um, in the States. We just launched in the States last year. Uh, tell us about Aaron Wellness, the nutraceutical. You've kind of given us an introduction, but I really want to know, and, and again, you've given us a hint about this, but what sets your company apart? There's a lot of wellness brands. Oh, like when I walk in a, oh, yeah. you know, a healthy planet or any of these places, I see just endless aisles of different brands. And what makes your products unique and, and how, do you, how are you winning in the category? Well, I think one, because we're 100% female owned, female founded, and all the products are made by us. Like we're all, there's a team of us who are really into creating the best products we can possibly formulate. But the big differentiating factor is every single product has a complete program. So we have a QR code on the front of the, of the label that you can scan. And this was something that really translates back to when I was going, working through all my issues was it wasn't just one thing. It's not just nutrition and just movement. It's all these things together that make holistic health. And our mission is to empower women with holistic health. And that's a very easy statement to stay, but what does that really mean? And so we have five pillars and they are the thoughts you think, the friends you keep, daily movement, nutrition, and lastly, supplementation. And the way we're able to express that is through these QR codes. So every QR code has two meal plans. There's a video explaining in detail what all the ingredients do in that product. Plus, there is tons of information, educational information on each product about whatever health issue you have, whatever you're pertaining to to support you. There's affirmations. There's workouts. Um, So really looking at how we can support our consumer to stand in sustainable health and wellness. There is no magic pill. I wish there was. If I'd found it, I'd be a billionaire. But really looking at how we can support our customers. And I believe, and we are the only company that's doing that. So that's a really big differentiating factor. That's awesome. I mean, uh, really, uh, weight control, 
wellness uh, are really big topics uh, in 2024. Uh, the government, of course, uh, has noticed that there's there's lot go- lots going on in this space, and uh, they've uh, they've come forward with some some new regulations. Uh, I know that you've been involved with uh, some of these uh, policies. Uh, could you tell us more about how, what's going on with uh, with regulations and guidelines when it comes to health products in Canada in the last, I would say, in the last 12 months or so? Yeah, sure. So about... It's about 10, 15 years ago, I think. Gosh, I don't know the exact date. But um, CHFA, which is the Canadian Health Food Association, I sit on one of the boards for CHFA. But CHFA went to Health Canada and said, hey, we'd like some regulations. I mean, we want, as a, as a uh, industry, we want regulations within our industry. We said, hey, we'd like some regulations. We'd like to have natural health product numbers. Which a natural health product number, if you don't know, when I create a product, I have to submit to Health Canada all of the claims that this product is going to have, and it has to have all scientific backing. I mean, that is one mm-hmm. of the great things about Canadian supplements is you are buying, what is what we tell you your product will do or what our product will do, we actually have scientific proof and we are legally allowed to say this. So we submit that, then the Health Canada gives us a natural product number, an NPN, and that is located on the front of most natural health products. So when you pick up a supplement bottle, you can type that number into the database and it tells you everything that product has and what we're allowed to say that product does. So that's a great okay. We want that. That's, I mean, hands down, all of us want that. <laughs> Nothing's wrong. So whenever we actually see a claim, it is backed up by some scientific evidence. One hundred percent. If it is a Canadian product, that's where there's a little bit of gray zone. We have a lot of American products that are advertising and selling up through the states that have no MPNs, and that's where that's where we actually need to be focusing a lot of our uh, regulatory concerns is all these American companies that are advertising on social media outlets that you can purchase very easily that are claiming the most outlandish things on some of these commercials. Could you give us an example or two? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a hormonal brand, um, alleviate menopause symptoms in 30 days. Hormone replacement therapy won't alleviate menopause symptoms in 30 days. You know, I lost 20 pounds in two weeks. I lost, you know, there's no bloating. And like just some of these claims are so ridiculous. It's not just the supplement. That's one of the things about with even our mission statement, empowering women with holistic health. It's looking at all facets. You have to start eating better. You have to start moving your body. You have to start, you know, shifting the way you're thinking about yourself and everything else in the world that you have going on because thoughts have a lot of power. Like all of these things together can make changes. But to say that in 30 days, your menopause symptoms are some completely going to go away from a natural product is completely false. And not only that, in, in the American companies don't have to put the breakdown of ingredients. They do proprietary blends. So you never actually know exactly what you're getting. In Canadian supplements, on that ingredient panel, you will see exact amounts of every single one extract form and the dosages. So then you know what you're buying in each product. So that's the beauty behind having a Canadian supplement brand is that. And I had the great pleasure to go to Parliament with CHFA in May. We went and spoke to MPs about what is going on and just kind of talking about the new labeling that's putting into effect. And then also to this regulatory, um, these regulatory issues that are regulatory that they're trying to cost recovery, they're trying to put through. Um, And what was really interesting about that was that most MPs had no clue what was going on. (laughs) At all. all. (laughs) Was was that the health committee? No, that was just your MPs. Like that was, we went and met a bunch of different. uh, Oh, really? Had no clue. Yeah. So we went in, we had, um, I mean, CHFA is a fantastic organization and I would recommend anybody listening if they really want up-to-date news on what's happening with regulatory is to go to the CHFA website But in that we went in and we took in bottles and showed how the new labels are going to look and what this regulation is they're looking at passing and the costs it's going. The big thing is the cost, what's going to end up happening cost-wise for Canadians and how that's going to impact not only us and Canadians, but also our natural health retailers because they're not going to be able to compete with the Americans who are selling stuff up into Canada with no MPNs and no label compliance, and they're still, and they're able to take away, you know, they're going to kill a large percentage of natural health retailers in Canada. Have you ever uh, interacted uh, uh, with with the federal government before that experience? Uh, no, it was my first, Ottawa? no, it was my first time. So what, what did you learn? I think the big thing I learned was that a lot of the time we can think that, I guess we can think that that person there knows everything and they're out, they're doing this purposely. <laughs> when you work in, 
they have no idea. They're like, what's happening? Why are they doing that? Right. So they have really no clue. So that was the, I think you kind of step away with a little bit more compassion for people because you understand everybody's doing the best they can really in their positions and that not everybody really knows everything that's going on. So we were able mm-hmm. to bring light to that, which was fantastic. Um, and we got to sit in uh, the House of Commons and watch a bit of that. So that was really fun. It was just, it's, yeah, it was just an amazing time to be on the Hill and to be there together and realize that in our industry, I mean, we have, as you mentioned, we have a lot of companies in our industry and we have all band together, even if we're competitors and we sell same products or same ingredients, we've all band together on this one common cause because what we know is this is not this is not going to benefit Canadians in any way, shape or form to have all these costs coming through. What are the main things that uh, you believe businesses should know about some of the changes coming up uh, in your field? Well, so right now what's kind of, what's interesting, I'll I'll just kind of touch on this for a second. What's really interesting too is this, this whole campaign for this cost recovery. I don't know if you've seen some of the pamphlets in your health food store where you sign a, you know, a little postcard and mail it in, but it's the largest last grassroots campaign in 10 years. And this was all across all parties and regions. And it actually caused Mm -hmm. standing committee to stop and pause and pay attention because 82% of Canadians use a natural health product and 95% feel they're safe. And the big thing that's resonating through all this is the cost that's going to happen. So this is going to drastically increase the cost of supplements. And Canadians just aren't interested in paying any more money. And so if I look at, and what I will say too, is we want regulation. We are all on board for that. We just want it to be an even playing field. So what we do know is Health Canada has kind of taken a pause as to what's happening. So we'll end up seeing in the next little bit if we can actually kind of all come back to the drawing board and say, okay, what works for everybody, right? What works for all of us? And if I would say for somebody coming into our industry, I mean, the big thing is to really understand uh, NPNs, natural product numbers, make sure you have a good team that you're working with that can advise you. Um, I mean, I've had, it's taken me years to find the team that I finally have and they're Mm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've spent... Oh my gosh, so much money on, you know, putting an MPN <laughs> in, and then I can't have the claims I wanted to have because I wasn't working with somebody who really, you know, went, hey, Aaron, to get this claim, you have to increase the dosage by XYZ. So you really yeah. want to make sure that component, especially with dealing with Health Canada and NPNs. And I mean, I would also say, I would get my NPNs in as soon as possible. I mean, cost recovery is going to, there will be cost recovery. We are going to have to pay something towards getting an MPN, which is fine, but there will be a cost recovery happening. Right now, we don't pay to file an MPN. It's free, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So the cost Mm -hmm. they're putting forth go up to $60,000 for an MPN. Wow. So if there is somebody who, as long as they don't want to come in my space, you know, you can come in, but just don't come in my area. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, listen, it's, you know, it certainly puts up as an economist would say a barrier to entry. Like you've got to be serious about what you're doing to pay that kind of money to get an, you know, to get your MPN. There is no way I would have started my brand. There is no Mm. way I would have started my brand if cost recovery was in place, especially what they're putting forth right Mm. now. I couldn't even touch it. Right. So what that does is that eliminates mm. competitive market. And again, it's going to cause people to go somewhere else to shop that are not getting, they're not getting regulatory products anyways. Mm. Right. So we really need to find a fair mm. playing field. And we also want to encourage people to come in. I mean, innovation is what keeps our industry alive. I mean, the big guys need mm. pro- companies like myself because I'm constantly coming up with new ideas and, and they can't yeah. move as fast because they're such a big machine, right? So they look at stuff. Yeah. Like you know, it's, it's, it's such an interesting industry. You know, I, I, uh, I actually have a bit of experience with it because I was a uh, product in charge of product and marketing for a, a weight loss retailer. Oh, okay. Herbal Magic back in the day, if you remember. Oh, well, Magic. of course I do. And so I've applied for and got a bunch of MPNs myself. And, and you know, my, for my first introduction to the industry was I, 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 was, I was in a big, one of these big trade shows in Vegas. And I'm like, there's a bit of a hustle going on here, like reputationally. Like I, I was, you know, watching what was happening and, you know, you'd come up with some kind of ingredient at that time. It was red krill or green krill, just exactly what you're saying. And they'd ship it off to Dr. Oz, pay him a suitcase oh, full yeah. of money. He would say it works. And in two months, he'd forget about it, move on to something else. I mean, he basically testified to Congress all about that nonsense and yeah. admitted, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it works. And so reputationally, is this the solution? I mean, you've said you, you're really a fan of MPM and the regulation. So if you, uh, let me, let me ask you this question. You had a magic wand or you are now the minister. Ooh. What would you 
do differently? I mean, A, we want, um, we, we, I think you would agree that the NPN and, and having people have confidence in mm-hmm. the products they're buying, that the claims are, are tested is a good thing. Is it, is it a barrier from uh, external international products that need to reach that same threshold? Because it's so bad, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think many products that are imported into Canada have to still, um, have to still comply with Canadian regulations. Oh, they have to, yeah. Right? So, so how, is, how, is this, how is this happening and what would you do differently? Hmm, magic wand. Um, well, one no. of the things, I mean, I definitely would keep, I would definitely keep NPNs in place, hands down. I mm-hmm. would, I would pursue cost recovery where there is a charge to have an NPN, mm-hmm. but I would really mm-hmm. look at ways in which I can make it work for the people like myself who are creating mm-hmm. new products and trying to be innovative, mm-hmm. where it's not mm-hmm. going to handcuff me, where I can't, you know, if I find a new ingredient and I want to create a product and put it together, if I pay $60,000 mm-hmm. before I'm out the gate, after I've paid my formulators mm-hmm. and everything along that line, what if the product doesn't hit? What if it yeah. doesn't, like yeah. there is those products, you launch them mm-hmm. and just something yeah. is not sure. the right time. Sure. So then you lose that and you lose all that money. So I think mm-hmm. having a reasonable cost recovery in place, I think that's a hundred percent what we need to do. And if mm-hmm. I definitely could is having, having some sort of safeguard from products that are shipping into Canada, that are being advertised in Canada. If you're going to advertise on Instagram and Facebook into Canada, I think you Mm. should have an MPN product number. You should have the claims that you're making. You should not be able to make outlandish claims. They have to fall within Mm. the scope of what your product scientifically is proven to do. I think that's really important as well. Um, So those are definitely two things I would for sure do. I would focus yeah. on the products advertising into Canada right now and shipping into I guess, Canada. I guess it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to control the wild west of the platforms. I it guess is. It's, it's, it is. How do we control <laughs> Exactly. That? Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, it's, it's not a new problem uh, for the industry, but you've articulated it uh, so well. Any other last advice? And then I'll pass the mic back to Sylvana for entrepreneurs who look, who are listening to this and go, you know, I got great ideas. I'd love to be part of this industry. What would your kind of advice be to them? What would you, what would you say to, to you? What would you say to yourself a few years ago as you're starting on the journey? Um, well, for one, I'd say definitely go for it. I mean, yes, there's sleepless nights and yes, I work nonstop, but <laughs> I, I know I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in this world. And I know that for sure. And I think, you know, we get one chance at this glorious life. So go for it. That would be my one thing. But in that, surround yourself with some really good mentors that you can ask advice from. There's really great programs for entrepreneurs you can kind of get yourself into that are for women entrepreneurs that have mentorship if you need that. And then the big thing with mentorship as well is to listen to your mentors. A lot of the time you can have people give you great advice and you're like, no, I'm going to do my own thing. So learning to differentiate between when you should really listen and heed and pay attention to what they're saying to you and when you really need to kind of go for it and see what happens and throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Um, but I would say, you know, this is a, we would, have you, a, re- would you recommend a spin on the dragon's den? I did How the dragon's den. That was incredible. Mm-hmm. And that's, we got on mm-hmm. dragon's den with the QR codes. Um, yeah, dragon's den was an incredible experience. Um, I do a lot of public speaking after that. I can mm-hmm. speak anywhere, anytime. <laughs> so it was, it was a great experience. Um, and actually after that show, I went and won innovative product of the year with our boric acid. We were the very first company in Canada to launch a kit with boric acid. So I had to do the same dragon's den style pitch in front of an mm. audience, 150 retailers. Wow. And I had everybody scream vagina. It was so much fun. And you would never realize how many people <laughs> love screaming that word. Like I was like on the count of three, one, two, <laughs> three. And everybody was like, Vagina. And to this day, <laughs> though, I have people walk up and they'll be like, vagina, when they That's see That's a me. weird way to say hi, so, but yeah. I'm the vagina lady. But um, but yeah, so I think <laughs> I was saying to definitely go for it and, uh, and definitely do Dragon's Den. If you have an opportunity to get uncomfortable and put yourself in front of, you know, especially on television, put yourself, you know, and be able to answer for your business, it is a fantastic experience. We're uh, we're starting a new year, and uh, since you're a health and fitness and wellness expert, uh, I think we need to ask you for some advice. (laughs) So what should be our New Year's resolution when it comes to health and wellness in in 2024? So uh, what are your thoughts? I'm sure you get that question a lot, probably from your family, friends over the holidays. Well, we're asking you. What are, what are the tips that we should be following for 2024 when it comes to wellness? 
Well, for one, the big one, lift heavy weights, lift weight bearing exercises. Um, I mean, it's really great now. You see a lot of young women in the gym. When I, I started working out at 15, so I've always been in the gym. I've always lifted heavy weights. Now you see a lot of younger women in the gym lifting heavy weights, which is great, but there's still a lot of women and even some men too, who really stick to the ellipticals and the treadmills. They feel safe there. They do a lot of cardio and cardio is important for heart health, but lifting heavy weights is one of the most important things you can do to keep that lean muscle tissue. That's going to help with your bone density. It's going to help with dementia. There's connections with brain health. It's going to help with type two diabetes as you get older. So all of these different things together are really, really important. Weight bearing exercises is my number one, lift heavy weights. Number two is protein. People do not get enough protein. They tell me all the time, I get enough protein in my day. They'll have like one egg. I'm like, no, that's not enough protein. I recommend, especially women, especially older women too, one gram of protein per body pound. So to really up the protein levels, protein creates lean muscle tissue, protein helps with blood sugar support. So it's going to stabilize that blood sugar. Really, really important. That's the, that's the ingredient really that can shift your body, right? You lift heavy weights and start having more protein. You can really start reshaping your body the way you want it to, ha- to do. Um, three, I would say for women, I'm going to, cause I am a women focused company. Um, a lot of women, especially if you start getting in your late thirties are going to be entering perimenopause. I suggest most women to start doing a blood panel, go into your doctor, get your blood panel, get your results. So you kind of know where your hormones are. I started my blood panels at 35. I've been doing one every year since, and now I'm going to be entering, I'm perimenopause now, but as I go into menopause, we have this information that I've tested every year. So we know exactly where my hormones have been and where we want them to be. So I think that's a really important thing. So you do a blood panel, you're going to be testing your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, free bound testosterone, just go in and ask your doctor for that. And then number four, use great quality supplements like Aaron Wellness. <laughs> yes. There you go. There you go. No, nothing that wrong with a little self one. <laughs> nothing wrong with a little self I have to fall in line with my oh. five pillars. But really, um, yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> find a great supplement that works for you. You know, yeah. I uh, with women, I think definitely, you know, our hormonal support product, Reclaim, is one of my favorites. And mm-hmm. um, find stuff that works for you. And, you know, whey protein, get a good protein. I recommend that highly. Um, yeah, there's some great supplements in the, mar- in the market. And with Canada, you can trust the products that are here. And not only that, you're supporting the Canadian economy. So if you're looking at buying mm-hmm. a product across the border, just take a second and really think about how, you know, we, we talk about wanting to support Canada. So really mm-hmm. look at how not only can you support can- Canadian suppliers like myself, but go into your natural health food store and support them too, because they really need the support right now. Where can folks uh, go to get in touch with you or learn more and, and you know, throw some uh, social media links our way and then let the audience know how to get in touch? Sure. So our website, erinwellness.com. So it's spelled a little different, A-E-R-Y-O-N. So it is pronounced Erin. So erinwellness.com. I'm on Instagram, Erin Bella Ashley. We have Instagram for Erin Wellness, Erin Wellness. We have Facebook. Uh, X, it's not Twitter anymore, YouTube, all air and wellness. You can buy all our products across Canada and natural health food stores um, from the West. When you're looking at nature's fair, whole foods, healthy planet, Vita health, all across Canada, we have our products, community naturals in Calgary. Um, so you can buy them across Canada in store, also online, and you can also buy them on Amazon as well. Well, listen, Aaron, I think after this conversation, I'm going to go and lift some weights. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I love that. <laughs> my purpose today is I, done. Yeah, I'm a cardio kind of person, so I, I, I absolutely uh, saw myself as you were describing some of the things that you see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the cardio guy that needs to lift more weight more weight in 2024 for sure <laughs> so yeah. thanks for the tip yes and thank you so much for joining us today it was great to to listen to uh to your uh to all your thoughts and, and uh, all the uh, the accomplishments that you've actually uh reached over the years and uh it's just great you're it's very inspirational so thank you so much for joining us today well thank you so much for having me guys i appreciate it it's been great all right. Uh, so, you know, from, from Aaron Ashley to uh, a couple of things that I wanted to wrap up with. Did you notice, and I guess uh, uh, congratulations goes out to Lino Saputo, appointed member of the Order yes. of Canada. Congratulations, uh, Lino. Yes. Uh, his Bravo. father, I believe, uh, so he's the chair of the board of NCO Saputo. I think his father was appointed uh, back in the time tunnel. I also want to congratulate Lauren Epworth. Uh, Lauren Epworth uh, was the former CEO of Crop Life, and uh, he's a former elected official. He's a he's a veterinarian, 
really. And uh, did a lot of work uh, in the field. So I was really happy to see his name on the list uh, in December. Well, in the in the same vein, and congratulations! Uh, shout out to uh, congratulations to Barry Murchie from uh, our friend Goodleaf Farms uh, yes. Vertical, vertical uh, Greenhouses, uh, opening a new ninety six thousand square foot facility in Montreal, and that will be their their third. It's Saint It's Saint Hubert. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, Guelph in one, Calgary in the other. Now in Montreal, I love the product. And my mom loves the product. The microgreens was an epiphany for us, yeah. uh, for her. Uh, so congratulations. I can't get enough of that product. It's tasty uh, if you have access to good leaf. Those uh, know, microgreens, they just pop in your mouth. Yeah. Pop. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and, they're, and they're really actually pretty safe for you too. We've had a, a busy show. Great start uh, to uh, the year. Uh, we've yeah. got a, a, full, uh, a full and interesting uh, half year ahead of us. Uh, we've got... Uh, We've got uh, Seattle coming up in Montreal, as I said. Yep. Uh, so we'll be getting together in Seattle. But uh, for now, why don't we leave it there? Uh, lots more to talk about next week. Uh, we'll have guests. Uh, we got guests lined up for the rest of our season. Uh, so like I said, let's leave it there for now. I'm Michael LeBlanc, Consumer Growth Consultant, Podcaster. And you are? I'm the food professor, Sylvain Charlebois. All right. Safe travels back home. Uh, stay warm because I hear it's cold there. And uh, talk to you next week. All right. Bye-bye.